One of the ways you can worship God with your whole life is just by being excellent in your gift and calling. So that's what I want to talk about today, right? Um, so, so here we go. Um, this, I'm going to have to uh, probably go back and forth a little bit here, but um, on the slide you'll see that there's a book written by um, Burnett and Evans. Uh, here we go. And it's um, these two professors teach at Stanford. They teach the most popular classes Stanford has ever had by the same title called Designing Your Life. Uh, Dave on the right, he's a Christian. Bill is not, but they just co-wrote a book. And in this book is where I got those, um, those statistics that you saw. Um, I have once had a pastor tell me, and I've got to stay uh, kind of in this uh, space here, but I once had a, a pastor tell me that all of this talk about calling and purpose and helping people find what they're supposed to do with their life, that's not really important, this pastor told me. What we really need to do is get them through Monday through Friday because no one likes that. Get them over to Sunday where they can really, uh, you know, worship God, whether it's like serving in children's or like tithing or whatever. He said, the pastor said, we got to get rid of this notion of calling and purpose being found in the work week or in the, in the study week and just get them over to Sunday. Here's the problem I have with that. There's a couple. One is, theologically, the word work and worship are quite literally the same in Hebrew. Work is meant to be worship. And secondly, some of you guys know this from your classes with Dr. Horner or Dr. Tanis, who've taught you on like the cultural mandate, but Genesis 1, which is before Genesis 3, work was given not as a curse, but as a blessing. Work is pre-fall, right? We were, supposed to, we were meant to work even before the fall ever happened. So work is a good thing. Work is worship. So we know it theologically, but we also know it in other ways, right? We know it um, empirically. At least 20% of Americans do find their work to be fulfilling and actually what they're supposed to be doing. So how do we get that statistic to kind of get reversed, right? Uh, by the way, I think my, all due respect to my pastor friend, I think if we followed his advice, do you notice that what would end up happening is we would give not our whole lives as worship to God, but only one-seventh of our life as worship to God, right? So my, my well-intentioned pastor friend, I think, ends up um, undercutting worship um, in a big way. So let me do this. Let me um, have us turn um, to Romans, 1, Romans 12. Actually, if you would stand with me, because whenever I read the Word of God, I want to re revere the Word of God. So if you would stand with me, I'll read uh, the passage, and then um, you can just kind of silently follow along, right? So here's Paul in Romans 12. You guys know the first couple of verses at least. You're pr probably pretty familiar. Now, hear now the reading of God's Word. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, Paul says, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves as sober judgment. For each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, right? Arms, legs, so forth. So in Christ, we, though many, form one body. We have different gifts. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance to your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. And if it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. So let me, let me just pray for us. Father, we come to you and we're asking that you would, by your spirit, speak powerfully through your word, Help us to um, really get this notion of calling well and maybe lined up with your truth so that we can live our lives fully for you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thanks, you guys. Have a seat. Um, so what I really want to get at is, um, and, I, and I appreciate the back and forth. We're going to have a lot of slides. So we're going to try to work through them quite quickly. But I want to define calling biblically. I want to help us discern calling. That's the most important part. How do you know what you and I are called to do, Right? Some of you guys are called to be an engineer. Some of you guys are called to be uh, an NBA player, like Steph Curry. I'll talk a little bit about Steph Curry in just a minute. Um, some of you guys are called to be an elementary school teacher. How do you, how do you know if you're supposed to go into social work or counseling? That's a fine distinction. Which one? Do you do more public policy work or do you go in more private care? Um, and thirdly, we're going to talk about some practical steps of how to deploy our calling. How do I actually use it for the kingdom? Right? So let me, let, me, uh, let me just jump right in. In terms of defining calling, I think it's very simple. Paul says in verse 1, hey, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. That's worship. But then he says in verse 2, and then we got to know what God's will is. In other words, we can say it this way. 
the will of God is our whole life worship. Now, wait a second, because the moment I say that, I realize what's happening. Our minds turn off because we think that's what I call Christianese, right? And I don't really stand for Christianese. I teach at Vanguard. I used to teach here. I taught, in fact, actually, in this very classroom, I taught Foundations of Christian Thought. Um, Dave Horner was, is a good friend. He's a mentor. And so I did some teaching here, which I appreciated. But I never let my students speak in Christianese. <laughs> Christianese is this language that we tend to speak in the Biola bubble or the Vanguard bubble, right? We all have it. Um, but what does it really mean? What it means is this. Verses 1 and 2 are actually, you would think, Paul is connecting them up to the rest of the chapter. So what do we have in the rest of the chapter? We have a lot of things like prophecy, service, teaching, making money, right? Some of you guys are actually called in the kingdom to make a whole lot of money. You guys are like, yep, that's me, <laughs> right? Like I actually, I have a friend. Uh, full stop. No, I'm just kidding. I have a friend, right? <laughs> oh my gosh. Come on, you guys. Give me something. I'm not Kevin Hart, but you know, whatever. Uh, so um, my, my friend, Sean, uh, we went to the MA, we did the MA philosophy program here together at Talbot. And um, he went on and went and got a JD, right? So he became a lawyer. I went on and got my PhD in theology. So he went on and made money and I'm doing theology, okay? So like, I, I'm doing theology, right? But, but Sean and I, of course, we have the same, similar passions. We deeply believe in the importance of theology and philosophy. Now, Sean, one of his biggest goals in life is to make as much money as he can so that he can, he can give money to people who don't have money, like PhD students who are thinking about theology and philosophy. Are you with me? So part of his, actually, it's true. So, I mean, he's, he's actually helped me out somewhat. And we got a friend, John and Erica, in Oxford right now because he's helped fund their way. He really means it. He's trying to make as much money as possible. And some of you guys hover somewhere in verses 6 through 8 or verse 13. And your calling is somewhere. And, and, and not all of you, by the way, are called to make money. Some of you guys are called to do theology like me or whatever. But oh, we all have a calling. So which, what is it? That's, that's what we want to get at. Um, so let me just say it this way. The, the, the first way... The first step to deploying the will of God in your life is by discerning the will of God for your life, right? The first step in deploying the will of God in your life is to discern the will of God for your life. So let's, let's get to discerning. Let's do that. But first, real quick, I need to do one last thing, and that's this. I want to make a distinction between what's called primary and secondary calling because if, if I don't do this and I don't want to be found guilty of heresy at Tory, they'll never, never invite me back. <laughs> um, but, uh, but Mike's a good friend, Mike. I might be back. Um, so primary and secondary calling is this, right? Primary calling is we're always called first to Christ. Are you with me? So we're called to be disciples, learn his way. And then we all, but we all have a secondary calling, which is a secondary calling from Christ, right? So that's where ambassadorship comes in. So we have a first calling always to Christ. It's, it's Mary before Martha, right? It's, it's sitting with the Lord before doing anything for the Lord, so we are first called to Christ, always learn of his ways. And then we do have a secondary, and that's where ambassadorship comes in. And I actually believe um, that someone like Steph Curry, he's to be an ambassador in the NBA. Some of you guys are meant, several of you guys are meant to be ambassadors in Hollywood or at net, you're, some of you should be a Netflix exec and influence culture in a powerful way. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about, ho quite a bit more about Hollywood because this is such an important area of culture. But, but always first, we are first called to Christ as disciples, learning his way, and then we're to represent him out in the world somewhere. So, so where is that? That's what I want to talk about, discerning our calling. Uh, first, first little story I want to share with you. So Paul says, look, you want to discern your calling? Don't think of yourselves too highly, right? Um, I'll give you a real example of this. Um, there's a gentleman here. His name is John Lennox. John Lennox, he's spoken here, here at Biola a couple of times. John is a friend. He's, uh, he's a professor at Oxford. He's a math genius. Um, he has three doctorates, like I, one in science, math, and theology, all earned doctorates, no honoraries here. He, he taught himself five languages, including Russian. B man is brilliant, right? But he's also very warm. He's like a, he's Irish, so you can kind of, he's like a Santa Claus, Santa Claus, like fatherly, grandfatherly figure. He's just gentle, great gentleman. Um, my buddy Max and I were in our last year of our PhD, and we were saying to ourselves, hey, what if we were to write a book together? What should we write on, right? And we were thinking through different topics, and we finally settled on one. We said, why don't we write on divine sovereignty and human free will, right? If God is fully in control, how are we free? I know 
Christian theologians and philosophers have been thinking about this for some 2,000, 3,000 years, but we're gonna, we'll figure it out and we'll write that book, right? We're just kind of encouraging each other. You write it philosophically, I'll do it for the theology component, we'll, we'll combine it, we'll write a book. We're like, yeah, sounds good, right? So arrogant. So we're like thinking about that. Next morning at church, we're with our wives, with Michelle and my wife Christine, and John Lennox comes and speaks at our church. We're like, oh, John's here. So he's talking on the book of Daniel. I don't remember everything he said, but at one point he said this. He said, we in, in this city are doing a lot of big thinking. We're, a lot of, we're thinking a lot of big thoughts. Some of you guys are doing astrophysics here in Oxford. Others of you guys are doing nanotechnology. Others of you guys are doing theology. And some of you, you need to keep doing that. Now, sometimes, and he was referring to the book of Daniel, sometimes we're called not to do those high-level thinking. It's somebody's job to do it, but it, not, it might not be yours. And then he goes, for example, some of you are, might be toying with the thought of divine sovereignty and human free will. I kid you not, Right? And he says, you shouldn't be doing that. Someone else says, you shouldn't be doing that, though. And then he pointed right at me and Max. No, I'm just kidding. He didn't do that. <laughs> that would have been nuts, right? But he did say that. So that kind of put me and Max on check a little bit. And we're like, hey, should we be, maybe we should re reconsider this, right? Now, I actually praise God that I kind of heard that message in a very timely way because if I pursued that particular academic interest, I probably would have run into one frustrating, frustrating roadblock after another trying to find a publisher or what have you. And God would have, I would have been outside my calling and instead, instead, I should have been writing my book on calling, which, I, which I've done, right? So God has something for you. So let's be careful to heed Paul's word where, word where he says, hey, don't think of yourselves more highly than you ought. Now, here's the deal. Some of you have the opposite problem. Some of you actually have too low a view of yourself. And that is an opposite problem, but the outcome is still the same, which is you and I, we lack self-awareness, right? We don't need too high a view or too low of you. We need an accurate view of ourselves. Because that's, that's self-awareness. I have a friend. Okay. <laughs> Come on, you guys. Another friend. That's, that's usually pretty funny. Um, so, so my friend, I won't name her, I'll give her actual name, but she's a psychiatrist. Long been working with adolescents in psychiatry. My wife's in uh, psych and mental health field, so I very much affirm this field as a crucial, crucial uh, place within the kingdom. Uh, we'll call her Jane. My friend Jane, I asked her, we're, we're working, several of us, on a Saturday afternoon, and we're just working away, and we we're taking a little break, and I was like, hey, Jane, I'm, so I'm writing this talk on sexual ethics it's for this youth group. Um, can I ask you, what, what, I mean, these statistics are just alarming. Can I ask you, what would you say is like one or two things you'd wish on every, I don't know, 14-year-old in America such that they wouldn't literally have to visit your office like in 10 years' time? Right? That was my question to her. I was basically saying, how do you put yourself out of a job? Right? Um, she's like, one or two things, and she thought about it for like half a minute, and she was like, I'll give you two things. I'll spare you the second one for now, but she's, the first thing she said is identity. If they get identity, if they get self-awareness, then, then think, other things won't be so attractive, like sex, drugs, Rock and roll, rock and roll's okay, I guess. <laughs> Most of it, some of it, <laughs> depends. But he, these things will not be attracted to them because they're so caught up with, with, with the call of God on their life, with their calling, that all these things just kind of fade away if they get identity, if they get self-awareness, right? And I was like, that's, that's really powerful. And so self-awareness, I think, is one of the keys to getting calling. So let me, let me do this. Um, so there's kind of a, kind of a short little uh, thought on, on how we can think about self-awareness. But let me do this. I'm pulling a lot of this stuff from the nonprofit um, that, that Livia kindly mentioned. We're at the, at the Renaissance. I'll talk more about that in a minute. But um, um, so we, have, we talk about the GPS, right? Like how do you navigate this crazy world and find your calling in the kingdom? How, how sweet it is when you're living your life in tune with your maker. That's calling, right? The reason why I, I refer to someone like Steph Curry I kid you not, and I mean this, and I can back this up theologically. When you see Steph Curry making a three-point shot, there is something literally God-like in what he's doing. Why? Because he's made in the image of God. He's been gifted with certain things. And every time he exercises that gift to glorify God, we see God in that gifting. Does that make sense? Like one of the best ways you can worship God ever is yet, St. Irenaeus, he's a second century saint. Some of you guys have learned about him. Irenaeus said this. He said, the glory of God, he doesn't finish it by saying, is a chapel service. He didn't say the glory of God is a Bible study. Then obviously God is glorified in, in a Bible study, in a chapel and so forth. But he says, the glory of God is humanity fully alive. Humanity fully alive. And don't you and I see someone like Steph or, 
or whoever you, I mean, Lecrae, we talked about earlier, when they're fully alive, when they're in their space, when they're in their calling, God is getting the glory and the world is being blessed, right? And that's what I think Aaronace is referring to. The glory of God is human. You and I fully alive. How do you get fully alive? You might say, oh, when I go to Six Flags, I mean, yeah. But when you're in your calling, it's lifelong. And God is getting a life, life worth of glory because you're in your calling because you're fully alive, right? Um, and this is what I really mean um, with respect to um, people like Steph. It's, it's literally the image of God is in us and we need to live that out with our gifts and passions. All right, so let me, let me try to, um, if I could, break this down a little bit um, into the GPS, right? So here's how I like to think about it. You, the G um, stands for gifts, okay? Um, if, if you're not going to write down anything else, like these three minutes, I hope it will truly help you because I, I, there's a couple of distinctions. And again, this is everything I take from the nonprofit group, but I've been thinking about this for a long time. But here, and I'll tell you exactly how long in just a minute, uh, about 11 years, and I'll tell you that journey. But um, gifts, just give you a couple of illustrations, are different from skills, even though we oftentimes use the same words. So here's what I mean. My wife, I think she's gifted with empathy. Like, it's incredible. Uh, we were at a cafe once um, during my doctorate, and uh, we were just studying away on a random day. And then I look over at her. We're taking, then we do like a little study break, right? Some of you guys know what I'm talking about, right? You guys study for five minutes and take a break for 55? No, I'm just kidding. Right? <laughs> Should be the other way, right? So we're working away. And five, 10 minute break, I look over at her. She's like on her tablet, right? She's kind of scrolling away on Facebook, right? And so then, um, I, and like two minutes later, I look over at her again, and she's crying. I'm like, honey, what's wrong? Is it the latte? No, I'm just kidding. Um, it was like, she was just crying. Two minutes. And she's like, didn't you see in the news, there's like these three people stuck in an elevator in Albania. She's, I don't even know where Albania is. You know what I mean? No, I'm sorry. Sorry if you're from Albania, but you get the idea, right? Like, it's in a movie. Like, that's a, I don't even know where Albania, anyway. Okay, so, um, so, um, uh, you know, she'll also get text messages from her friends. And, um, I was going to make a joke there, but you wouldn't laugh at it. So um, she gets text messages from her friends. Like, I was going to say, I don't, but whatever. And she'll get them, right? And she'll say, hey, pray for me. Pray for me. <laughs> Thank you. She said, pray for me. <laughs> she said, pray for me. You know, her friend's like, because, you know, I'm going through this thing or whatever. It's like 1130 at night or like it could be like 7 in the morning for all that matter. She will get the text and she will pray for her friend five minutes and then text her back and say, hey, I just prayed for you. I'm with you on this, right? Like that's her. She's just there. She's so empathetic right? Me, I get a text and I'll say, yeah, bro, I'll, I'll pray for you. And then I'll forget. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, don't judge me because we're in the same boat, some of us, right? <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about. So I, so, but that's my wife. She's empathetic, very deeply, naturally empathetic. Now, some of you guys psych majors know this. What's, a, a, what's an associated skill to the gift of empathy? And the answer is like active listening, right? Like active listening is you pause, you reaffirm, you, you ask a question, right? That active listening is a skill that's associated with a gift. What's more important, the gift or the skill? And the answer is it's always the gift. Because skills you can develop over time, but a gift is something you're born with, right? I'll give you another quick example of this. Um, entrepreneurs, any, 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 anyone aspiring to you know, start a small business, medium-sized, big business? Entrepreneurs are interesting kind of people, right? Uh, I think I kind of have an entrepreneurial bone to my body. Actually, believe it or not, uh, I, I, I started a clothing line, a house cleaning business, um, all kinds of stuff. So I have kind of an entrepreneurial bone in my body because something's got, something's got to pay the bills. Remember, I do theology. <laughs> so, um, so, so here's the deal with entrepreneurs, right? You guys are, are weird. We're weird. There's only about 15% of us in the world. Why? Because most humans are risk averse. That means we're born like not liking risk. No one wants risk. That's how we survive, right? That's how we stay away from fire and stuff, right? Um, some of us see risk and we're like, yes, this is an opportunity. I'm going to crush it. We're going to make it, right? You're non-risk averse. Are you with me? That's a gift. Some of you are born with that. Now, if you could, what's the skill associated with small businesses? Like hash, n narrative marketing is the big thing, right? Brand marketing, okay? So we all know about the skill associated with it. What's more important, the skill that you can hashtag market or, you c or whether you could, or you actually are non-risk averse? You've got to be non-risk averse. Otherwise, you can have all the skill in the world, but if you don't have that gift of being non-risk averse, every decision is going to freak you out. You're going to be so stressed out. You, you might do okay, but you're not going to be in your element, Right? So that's why I always say focus on gifts. Okay, that's the first thing. The second thing are passions, right? Passions are different from interests, right? 
interests are things that come and go with time. Like some of us, we say we're passionate about like, I'm passionate about Ben and Jerry's ice cream, about fish tacos, <laughs> like taco nazo. It's good stuff though. All right. And, um, and, um, and Jesus Christ, hopefully not in that order, but you're all passionate about these things, right? Here's the deal. You're not. You're passionate about Jesus, hopefully, but I don't, you're interested in fish tacos, Taylor Swift and Ben and Jerry's. The reason I know is because two years ago, was Taylor Swift, right? And now you're no longer interested. And whoever you're interested in now won't be the case two years from now. Interests come and go. What are passions? Passions, in the Greek, you know, passion of, of Christ, passion week, is what you're willing to suffer for, right? Passions is like this. You're like, oh, I, I'm, I am passionate about IJM uh, fighting sex trafficking. Cool, great. Are you really? Are you willing to not take, to get $12,000 a year for the first year out of Biola? and work for them because it's your passion. And if you say yes to that, then yeah, you are passionate about it. You're willing to suffer for it. Are you with me? I, so I had a student, it was in Bardwell, right? Um, 112, and we were doing foundations in there, right? Because we needed to make use of the periodic table. No, I don't know, <laughs> right? You guys been in that room, you know what I'm talking about. But, but I, was, I was giving a similar thing on this, on passions, and my student said to me, Park, um, uh, with all due respect, like, yeah, I think my part of my calling is medical missions, but I'm zero passionate about Monday Night Labs, right? So I asked her the question, I'll call her Jane again. I said, Jane, hey, um, would you rather go every Monday night, three hours, I get it, hunchback, microscope, all that, and then med school and all that, or would you rather go and read Shakespeare for three hours at the library? And she's all, I don't even know how to spell Shakespeare, <laughs> right? Why? Because she's willing to suffer for her caller and her calling, and that's, can, can I help you define what your passion is, right? So GP, and the third thing, I'm going kind of quick, and this is a whole lot, and I was talking with Ted earlier, this is like a three-hour workshop at a church I typically do, and I, I invite, invite us out to your church, but um, there's a lot here, but I'm just trying to pack it in, and in these three minutes, I'm, I'm giving you the, 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 the heart of it, and here's the S, right? Um, serving God's purposes. Now, again, that sounds like Christianese, but it does come from the Bible, so we should let it be. But in Acts 13, 36, here's what it says. They sum up King David's life, number two guy in all of Jewish history, next to Moses probably, right? They sum up his entire life with basically half a sentence. King David served the purposes of God in his generation and fell asleep. He died, right? That's his tombstone, right? Like that's all he gets, right? Why is that? But why is that so telling? I believe that God has certain purposes that he's doing in your generation, in this generation, our generation, that he wasn't doing some 25, 30 years ago. And he probably won't be doing exactly the same thing 25, 30 years from now. But in this particular generation, he's doing something. And the way to figure out calling for you and I, in terms of getting secondary calling, is to figure out where our gifts and our passions line up with what God is up to. And we can serve God most fully. So what are they? Right, let me just say this. I don't think he has like 10 billion purposes in our generation. I also don't think he has like two. I think he has probably something like three or four or five dozen things he's doing in our generation. And I'll just give you an example of like one or two real quick. There's probably five that I've thought through and prayed through. And this is something that you wanna seek out mentors for to figure out how do you line up your gifts and passions. But uh, for example, what's called AME, right? Arts, Media, Entertainment. I believe the Lord is doing something powerful in that particular area. And Biola is a good example of that. And by the way, uh, by the way that you guys have started a, a tremendous program are continuing that on and continuing to fund it in a big way. Um, arts, Media, Entertainment is affecting our culture in a way that has never been the case for literally 95% of human history. But it's our particular moment. And so how do we do this? How do we not, a, not commit the same mistake that, to be all, with all due respect, right, our parents' generation, even my parents' generation, have made the mistake of, and that's this. Hollywood is too dark a place for Christians. Let's all vacate it. Only to have the church play Johnny Come Lately and play catch up for the last 60 years. Are you with me? And then finally come around to start trying to produce some films, but, you know, they're kind of cheesy, right? Like for lack of better, um, you know, like for example, the movie, no, I'm not, I won't say the name, right? But you all can, you all know what I'm talking about, right? Because we go on and make our own little production company that's all a little small and it's all low budget or whatever. Whereas I think of my good friend, he's on the Renaissance board, um, uh, Renaissance group board, and I'll, I'll, I'll have a picture of him in a minute. But Ralph Winter, some of you guys know him, he produced like X-Men, Mighty Joe Young, Star Trek, he's big time, right? Hollywood producer, Ralph Winter. So I was hanging out with Ralph one day, I said, Ralph, um, 
I'm just curious, how do you do faith at work, right? Like, how do you bring your Christian faith, your Christian worldview to bear on your filmmaking? Um, and do you witness on set? Like, I'm just kind of curious about how you do life there. And uh, I wasn't expecting a particular answer. I wasn't gunning for an answer, but he said this. He said, Rich, I, I actually witness all the time on set. I was like, really? I wasn't expecting that. He said, yeah, I do. And then sometimes I take them out for coffee afterwards and share the gospel with them. Some of you guys are catching it. Some of you guys aren't. Here's what he says. He says, I make films as best I can of the highest production value and quality I can on time and under budget. I witness all the time. That's powerful. That's a way of making your work worship. Are you with me? And then he goes, occasionally I take out my crew members to a coffee or treat them to dinner, and maybe I'll say a word about the actual gospel to them. But I witness all the time. How do you take your gifts and passions like Ralph Winter is right now and bless the world and point them to Christ? And I think in S, serving God's purposes, AME, arts, me, entertainment, is one of those huge sectors in which that needs to to happen. It is happening. Scott Derrickson, graduate of Biola, right? It's Dr. Strange, you guys know? He's a director, right? He's a devout follower of the Lord. And, and we need, we ne I'm not saying everyone in this room, all 500 of you go, whatever, go and be a Scott Derrickson because that might not be your calling. I probably 25 of you are supposed to be the next Scott Derrickson or work with him, right? I know Max, uh, one of the guys who used to, he's a student here, used to work with us. He was like DMing Scott and there's just, you got to be, here's another serv serving God's purposes. Psych and mental health. The mental health, and I don't like this word, but that's how the government uses it. The mental health industry in 2012 went from $2.4 trillion, believe it or not, and in 2016, it was 3.7. That's just, it's unfathomable. Now, what I'm saying is don't consider mental health because there's job security or there's profit to be had, but because there's pain there and the Lord needs Christian thoughtful counselors in those places to redeem that world too. So arts, media, entertainment, mental health, another area is racial reconciliation. The, the government hasn't done a great job. Schools aren't doing it well either. But the church, which is literally the most ethnically diverse body in the world, don't we have a chance to take a forefront on that and embody it and, and be a part of it? <laughs> the reason why I like Lecrae so much um, is because we actually met here at Biola. We actually had an exchange. So as far as I know, we're friends, right? So like... <laughs> Lecrae and I, he doesn't know it, but I know it, okay. Like, we, were, no, we, we really had an act. Some of you guys might have been there at the concert. We were chatting. I asked him a question, and he was, he was telling me, oh, man, I'll, I'll tell you the story later. But the reason why I appreciate Lecrae is because after his Anomaly album dropped, it went number one on iTunes, some of you guys know. When it went global number one on iTunes, or billboards, and then it, it was just crazy. It went all the way, Jimmy Fallon and all the rest. And Lecrae gets interviewed at Instagram, Snap, and all these headquarters. And I think it was at the Instagram headquarters interview. They said to him, Lecrae, what, so you made this album, Anomaly. You got one track on there called, um, it's about racial reconciliation. What's that all about? Tell us. And he was like, well, look, I'm a black man. And um, I believe in, in the importance of white, black racial reconciliation. But if you really want to know, I believe Christ came to reconcile all things. And race is just one of those. Like, he can do that because he's built up the credibility through the excellence of his work. Are you with me? Like, I feel as evangelicals and Pentecostals, charismatic, we, brought, broadly speaking, try to go so quickly to what I call the verbal gospel that we forget that painting the visual gospel is important too. Right? So, I, and how do you paint the visual gospel? By being in your calling. By being excellent in your calling. I'm telling you, Steph Curry, when he does his post-game interviews, I, I do appreciate once in a while when he says, I do it for the Lord, but I also appreciate when he just does it on the court, right? And he earns his credibility by being excellent. And the way to be excellent is finding your gifts, not your skills, your passions, not your interests, and getting a mentor to kind of walk alongside and help in that way to help serve God's purposes. Um, all right, so, so um, we, can, we can go on about this. Um, let me just give you the verse here in Proverbs 22. Do you see a man skillful in his work? He will stand before kings, not before obscure, uh, obscure men. The book of Proverbs, as you guys know, is not a book of promises. It's a book of principles. And generally speaking, when you are excellent and excellently and skillfully carrying out your gift and passion, you will stand before kings. And by the way, I believe, this is my cultural theory on it, that the kings of the today are not prime ministers and presidents so much, but they are actually more the cultural gatekeepers, right? It's Hollywood. It's social. It's influencers, right? It's these, these are the gateways to our culture. And so if you want to see a person 
who is standing before the kings of our day, I will tell you that that person probably has stood before a mirror, right, if they're an actor, or stood before their teachers or textbooks or what have you and grinded it out. Let me just say this. I think your 20s and your 30s are for tilling. Your 20s and your 30s are for tilling. You just till the ground and just grind it out. Just get excellent in your gift and your passions. Your 40s and your 50s, as my mentor, Dr. Oz Guinness was here just recently at Biola. He's a mentor of mine. I met him at Vanguard 11 years ago. And I actually approached him. I said, I said Oz, to so Dr. Guinness, um, what would you tell a 30-year-old who has interests as wide as this world and passions that run deep? And he gave me a couple pieces. He wrote a book on calling. And then he, uh, and then he said, but actually, I would just tell that 30-year-old to, to email me, <laughs> which is very, very gracious of him. And so we did. So on started a 10-year, we, we, 11-year friendship to this day. And uh, because of him, I, I went all the way to Oxford and back and with my wife. And I kind of lived into my calling. And it took me 10 years to come up with a calling statement. But I say all that because the last thing he told me was, Rich, you, you do know that you, between, your for, between 40 and 60, that's your most productive years. And that, see, these little nuggets that you, you get it from mentors, right? And I want to encourage you to like, connect with us at REN because we're doing a lot of stuff on mentoring. I've got students at Biola and Vanguard that I'm mentoring. I can't do it all. We have a team. But mentoring, you know it's the genie in the bottle that you f if you find in the desert. The answer is always what? If you have one wish, what do you wish for? More wishes, right? So if I can give you one piece of advice, it would get a piece of advice giver, <laughs> a mentor, right? Get a mentor because... Even your, your, your buddy, no matter how close your best friend, girlfriend is to you, there are things that can only see, seem, be seen vertically. Are you with me? And not horizontally. And so someone who's 40, not 20, can see things in you better than even your best friend can with all loving respect to your best friend. Are you with me? So, so think about it. You got plenty of mentors here at Biola as well. I would take full advantage of your professor's office hours. Now all the faculty are going to email me and say, what is all this about people visiting my office hours? But I think it's, 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 um, it's a, a key way to do your college education. All right. Uh, let me just get some, done, a little bit of brass tacks on some practical tips perhaps here on, um, on how do we really get into our calling? How do we, um, how do we um, do really figure this out, right? Uh, uh, so three, three quick tips I picked up along the way. Trial and error, saying no, and we're better together. Real quick, trial and error. Here's the here's interesting uh, thing that, th remember those guys at the beginning, the pro Stanford profs? They wrote, for most people, passion comes after they try something, discover they like it, and then develop mastery, not before, right? They, they've had like tens of thousands of students go through their course at Stanford, grad and undergrad. It's the most popular class at Stanford. And he, they said, passion doesn't come like when you're just sitting and praying. Praying helps, but just sitting and praying won't always de deliver you a passion. What happens is this. How many of you guys have friends who go to like a short-term mission trip, right, with the team here at Biola or wherever, and then they come back and they are fully alive, right? They're like, I know what I was made to do now. I found my calling, right? It's because they've done the thing, they come back and, right, or a summer internship, they've done something and they fully know what they're doing. So I would say rather than, you know, graduating here and then sitting around for, for half a year, is, which is what I did, because I didn't want to make a mistake. I didn't want to go down a certain road and then realize, wait a second, this is not me, and I just wasted six months in grad school or six months at that job or this job, right? But here's my encouragement. I call it the playground analogy. How many good fathers do we know who, where if you were to go on the swings, let's say, and you're like a little kid, and you fall off the swings, like that's a calling you're trying out and it doesn't work out. How many good fathers would we go, oh, Susie, oh, the swings, that, that's not you, huh? That's, I'm so sorry. And then walks away, right? <laughs> like, no, right? A good father, our father in heaven, will re always redirect and redeem. I actually have a friend at, um, at Vanguard. She's a staff member. And she and her husband were at another job previously. And now, obviously, she's at Vanguard as a staff member. Um, they both hated their previous job. Hated it. Like, really? But did God redeem it? They met at the previous job. They have a wonderful marriage, right? So don't worry about those six months. You might try it somewhere else because the Lord has an interesting way of redirecting to the next calling, which is your call, and also redeeming whatever happened that previous calling, right? So I want to free you up. Oh my gosh, if I heard this when I was your age, okay, now I am sounding old. But like when, if I were to heard, heard this, that would have saved me years of heartache and headache. So that's the first thing. Um, uh, 
kudos to Dr. Horner here, uh, again, a good friend. Um, I was once speaking at a pastor's conference in the Philippines about 10 years ago, like, like this, and um, we had landed in the Philippines, 16-hour flight. We we're dead tired, right? Dead tired. But we stayed up so we can fight jet lag. We get to our conference. I'm the last speaker, so like five hours at night or whatever. I'm the last speaker. It's like 9, 10 at night. The MC, uh, we do Q&A. He grabs the mic back. And he says, how many of you guys enjoyed that? Yay. How many of you guys um, enjoyed the Q&A? Yay. How many of you guys would do like to do another hour and a half of Q&A, right? And without like thinking, I grabbed the mic and I was like, I would. I would love to do because I was I'm just enjoying it. And then I looked over my team and they were like, uh-uh, no. <laughs> like we need to get back and rest, right? And I was half joking, but I was half serious. We get back to the place where we're staying. I jump on my laptop and I emailed Dave Horn, Dr. Horner. And it just time zone difference, but he happened to be online on emails. So I wrote him. I said, hey, Dave, I think I know what I was made for. Or I, I think I know what I was born for. And then he, just, he, happened, he wrote back within like five minutes. He said, Rich. I'll never forget these words. He said, Rich, pay, it's, he said, pay attention to your body. He said, very few people, if ever, in their lifetime would ever have this experience. Pay attention to your body. And at first I was like, did Dave go new age on me? Like, what is that, right? Like, pay, this is like, what, nam, namastra, oh, what is the yoga term? I don't know, like the thing, right? Um, what is it? Okay. Um, like, <laughs> um, like <laughs> there's this term, right? Um, but, but I know what he was saying, right? He's saying there's a way in which God has wired you down to the core of your actual being and body that you can feel alive when you're in your calling. So you've got to go out and do the things, what I'm saying. Go to internships, go to wherever and get mentorships so that you can figure out what you were made to do. And it only comes after you, you try the thing. I'm going to skip for time's sake. The saying no component, better, better together. There's a lot to be said here. Um, um, but let me, let, me, uh, let me give you this stat, right? So 48% of millennials, so half of all millennials, and by the way, I think where you are now in that generation that's moving from millennials to what they call plural, so you're more like, you're, um, you're kind of out of that time, bra that year bracket. But um, millennials will say this, or slightly older friends than you would say this, 48% of them will say, God is calling me to a different line of work, dot, dot, dot. But, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> so they wrote yes to that. Like, God is telling me to do something else. I know he's calling. No, I'm not wondering anymore. I know he's calling me to do something else, but I'm not, but, but that's it. Like, I'm not willing to make that jump, right? So they're like, I will live in disobedience. Yes, right? Like, that's basically what they're saying, right? Why? Because there's parental pressure, there's financial pressures, there's social pressures to do this or the other. But I would encourage you to do this. I would encourage you to think of someone like Steve Harvey, <laughs> who, if you YouTube him, and actually, I, I believe he's a follower of the Lord. He had a hot mic that he didn't know it was on. It was done, Family Feud was done. He's just talking to the audience. And suddenly, and they were still recording it with the camera. Some of you guys have seen it. It's like an eight minute, nine minute. It's really cool. Um, it's practically a sermon on calling. I, keep, I think he actually uses the word calling. But you got to YouTube it. Steve Harvey, Family Feud, jump. Like if you look that up, he'll say this. He said, look, all of you guys see me, Steve Harvey, big time, whatever, Warner, you guys see me, and all you see is this like level of greatness that I've achieved. But what you don't see is two things. One, 20 years of just grinding it out, making anywhere from 50 to $250 a month, which even with inflation is very small. And the second thing you don't see, so that's my encouragement to you, is just grind out your, your gift and your, and the second thing he says you don't see is this. You don't see that at one point, it was very scary for me. I had, didn't even know if the parachute was gonna open, but I jumped right? I jumped, and I just trusted the Lord that he would make it happen. Now, what I'm not saying is everyone drop out, go to, you know, make that film, or uh, move to Africa, whatever. Like, no, maybe, maybe, but probably not. What I'm saying is this. I know somebody, and this is who I was referring to earlier, here's Ralph. I know somebody who did jump, right? He jumped, and he made X-Men and all that, and he said, okay, now it's time. I'm going to make a, a, a production company, myself, Phil Cook, and one other, three of us, are going to make this production company. They need to raise $10 million to make that production uh, company fly. They raised the first $5 million. Before they can get to the next five, when they were taking trips to meet donors and so forth, they burned through their first five. So it never, it never, it never took off. So he jumped, but he didn't have a parachute, and it didn't land well. So how do you know? Whether you go, oh, man, you watch a Steve Harvey YouTube video, right? And you're all inspired, like, oh, you know? And you, I've, I've been there, right? Or Gary, Vayner, v, Gary V or whoever, Tony Robbins or like whoever, right? You're like ready to go. And then, and then 
And then Ralph even took a calculated risk and he went, went for a production company, but it didn't work out. So how do you know which to do? And I actually think there's a couple answers to that question. Maybe I'll just mention two. One of which is mentors, like I talked about. It's really important to get a mentor who really knows you well. And there's, there's, there's ways to think about what a good mentor is. And we could talk about that maybe afterwards. Or you can buy me a steak dinner and then I'll, you know, whatever. Um, um, but the second thing is actually what I call the 525 principle. And um, if you want to know what that is, um, you do have to st buy me a steak dinner. Let's pray. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> oh my gosh. How <laughs> mean, right? No, it's actually this. It's just Galatians 525. Right? Galatians 525 says, if we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. You've got to have such a strong community and of mentoring going on in your life that you can together with them discern the timing of when you are to jump, right? So let me just encourage you with that, you guys. Um, I, I, most of my life, I live in regret. You guys are like, oh, that's terrible. I live in regret in the sense of I live out my regret by trying to redeem my regret. One of the things I've experienced, I mean, I did so many things in my life. I worked at a law firm. I worked, like I said, I started a clothing company. I, um, I, um, um, I did stand-up comedy. Didn't work out. No, I didn't do that. Um, I did a lot of things in my life, right? I wish, I wish I had some of this on the front end because it would have saved a lot of heartache. And so out of my regret, I'm trying to live um, and, and sort of redeem it by kind of sharing with you guys. So I hope you guys um, have a chance to kind of think through and pray through all the sessions that you're, that you're experiencing. But I would want to have you take calling as sort of a filter, a lens through which you receive all other messages. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Because then every message applies in, in to you in a particular way that, that's the way that you're shaped, the way that you're supposed to be called, right? So I would encourage you to just really think through this stuff on calling and um, we'd love to connect in various ways here, uh, maybe chat afterwards. But at this point, let me just pray for us. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.